Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Welcome to Studio X in EMS. We are delighted to have David Rosenboom with us for this week and the next. And he's uh, uh, David is a, a composer, performer, interdisciplinary artist uh, who was a student here in the late 60s and has gone on to uh, write some incredible works and hold some esteemed positions at uh, York University, Mills, CalArts. Mm -hmm. Those um, are the big three. <laughs> the big three. Yeah. So uh, he's giving a, a talk today on circuits and fingers, and I'm really looking forward to it. So um, I also want to give a thank you to Anastasia, who uh, put this entire two-week residency together and is kind of the brain behind it all. And I also want to thank my TAs, uh, Xavier, who uh, got all this set up. I did nothing. <laughs> and Jinju, who is here, uh, going to be taking some pictures for historical uh, purposes. So um, without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, don't take me as an example. I'm sure I'm, I'm violating a, 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 an important studio rule here with my caffeine. But it's a busy, busy time. So uh, anyway, I'm glad to be here. Thank, uh, I know we only have an hour, so I'm going to try to jump in. And it was suggested that I, I um, uh, really am talking about what is an instrument, how to, how, you know, uh, um, ideas about design that relate to uh, things having to do with electronics. And so uh, it was suggested that I at least start by focusing on an instrument that Don Buchla and I designed together called the Touche. Um, it was... We worked on that during the year, uh, year 70, I think we started in July of 79 and finished uh, probably around April or so of, uh, of 80 and had what, uh, always when there was a, uh, a new instrument launch, there was a huge party and uh, KPFA Radio would host that party. I still have the cassettes of the of that uh, of that radio show, which um, you know, it, it's a, a high security document. That you can't get in the no, I'm kidding. People would say anything they wanted to do, but anyway. So it, it was the idea that that um, we were going to make one. Now Don was not really a black and white keyboard person, right? He didn't really like the black and white keyboard, but he did make s several instruments that did have black and white keyboards boards. But one thing that really drove a lot of Don's um, design ideas was his friends and people that he wanted to make instruments for and so he would have certain models and so um, I guess two keyboard players that were very close friends of his, of his, of his were me and uh, J.B. Floyd, great pianist um, and so we, we hatched the idea uh, I had been out there er, several times, uh, out there meaning at, in the 70s I was at York University and I had a sabbatical and I came out there and we worked on developing what was called the 300 system, which was uh, one of his uh, uh, computer controlled analog systems um, that uh, was a great system, really beautiful system. Uh, and then we, one thing led to another and finally um, uh, decided, okay, we're going to take it take a stab at making a digital keyboard instrument. And so um, the idea was to um, make them a sort of maximally, a maximally a timbrally broad instrument with minimum means. And so we um, decided to, to settle on focusing everything around nonlinear wave shaping. Uh, are you familiar with what that means? Some of you, yes, some of you, no. I, okay, I'll, sh I'll, I'll uh, show a little bit. Um, and uh, so uh, Don ha made his first actual digital oscillator uh, in hardware, uh, which was actually a 300 series module that would fit in a modular system like that. Uh, and it was the only time in my experience of watching Don as a circuit designer, and he was a virtuoso circuit designer, the only time he ever made a prototype. <laughs> because he would, he would just go from circuit diagram to uh, PC board layout, panel design, and then hopefully it worked. Now, if you were one of the people who bought, uh, you know, serial number one, you would find that there were a few carvings on the circuit board and a few resistor jumpers going here and there but when something, something needed to be corrected. But they generally, generally worked. 
but he did a wire wrap version of this uh, of this uh, digital oscillator, and and got it to got it to go. So it's it's digital sound generation, but in hardware, right? So. Um, and then, uh, well, I'll show you more of the architecture later. But in any case, digital sound generation, and then an analog back end, which um, had its its uh, signal outputs went through the. It's it's kind of a, a very unique kind of famous Buchla gate structure, uh, which is a, a co combination low pass filter and VCA, but not as separate units as an integrated circuit, where the concept was that the the um, the decay of the spe of the spectrum caused by the low pass filter and the decay of the amplitude were locked together in a way that simulated how a spectrum the spectrum of a sound decays if it's moving away from you if it's moving at sort of significant velocity away from you that was his concept and it was it was at least it was a, a metaphor for that idea was uh, in a, in the circuitry and that's one of the things that gave the buchla instruments their most significant sound you could say that I, that's a buchla sound it was those gates that really were key in making that so we kept that um, as a back end for the signal outputs and then there was um, what we call the marf multi arbitrary function generator which was basically a, uh, a hardware um, envelope generator where the length of the envelopes could be infinite because it, it was controlled by a microprocessor. So you could put a zillion breakpoints and you could, uh, you know, so you could make these long uh, controls, voltage controls that came out of it. The, and there was, it was 64 channels, so there were 64 of those. So they could be attached to virtually every sound generating parameter in the instrument. And it was under uh, um, uh, computer control so that you could put logic decisions at every breakpoint. So you could say, OK, proceed if key one is depressed, uh, otherwise loop back to here. Or if uh, some sensor you plug into the instrument is doing something and you can make or jump ahead or you, know, you can make all these logic decisions uh, in, the, um, in the envelope structure. So, um, so that's it, and then at the center of it, I, I designed the software for it and uh, chose to use a, 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 um, a, a, a Motorola, nine, no, a, um, a Texas Instruments 9900 processor, which was one of the first fully orthogonal 16-bit microprocessors. So you had 16 16-bit registers. Um, and it was great. TI had a drop on the microprocessor business at that moment. And they eventually came up with the 99,000, which was a bigger one. And then somehow it just disappeared. And you know, Intel took over and everything took over. But, um, and it ran an operating system that was a derivative of one that ran on the Digital Equipment Corporation PDP-10, mm -hmm. which was really pretty powerful. And so I chose to use that. And a guy uh, named blanking on it, maybe it'll come up with it, had a company in Sausalito, California called Marin Chip Systems. And uh, he had made these circuit boards to run on what was called the S100 bus, which was a, 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 a card bus from uh, the 70s <laughs> where uh, small computers could plug in cards and so on. So, so that's what it was. And uh, he happened to be the guy, his name, I'll, I'll blank on it. I'll, Maybe I'll think of it. Um, one day I went over there to, to, to get these circuit cards from him, and he said, uh, let me show you what I've been working on. And he showed me uh, something where, where you could lay out cards on a desktop in different kind of ways. And he said, what do you call that? Uh, I call it Autodesk. And then he said, no, I'll show you something else. And then he showed me ways you could design things. And he said, what do you call that? He said, I call it AutoCAD. <laughs> <laughs> And so that was where it started, and he took off and, and developed that. Anyway, that's a little bit of history, but there's, there's history in this. So let me show you the instrument itself. Um, and actually, let me get my, uh, my uh, call it a cat spooker, or you could call it a laser pointer. Um, so, so this is the instrument, and everything was controlled. There it is. 
We can't really see it on the screen. Reflect off the screen. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't work. Oh. Off, it, it reflects off the screen. Okay, so so um, everything is controlled off this panel. What you don't see, you'll see in another slide, is your, you need a monitor sitting on top uh, to do. You can control, you could program everything from these keyboards, these, these data entry buttons and so on. Um, you could also, th this would be the way that the, the, the average user would use it. You could also, and I did on my own version of it, um, connect it to 10-inch uh, um, floppy drives and, uh, you know, in a, in a terminal and so on so you could program. So let me go on and show you some other pictures. Just a close-up. So one thing, the way in which we worked, and uh, I would say if any of you are familiar with uh, the 2 and 300 system modules, if you have some over there, um, when we, we would sit down and talk about designing a module, it all had to start with what's the compositional purpose of this, right? And then from that co conceptual discussion would arise a design for a front panel. Not the circuitry yet, but a panel, because that was going to be the interface, right? That's the user interface. So we designed the panel, and then Don would go out and design the circuitry to go behind it. And uh, this was pretty much a similar idea. In the 300 series, the ones that we talked the most about were the, the um, source of uncertainty. You know that one? I claim inventing the name for that, <laughs> that module. And uh, because it was about, okay, Don, you don't have some, we need something that comes from stochastic music. And so that led to the source of uncertainty module. And then um, the programmable spectral processor, which was a modulatable, you know, modulatable multi uh, multi bandpass filter thing, and um, the kinesthetic input port, which was a, one of the keyboard designs, stuff like that. So so uh, so we started out by looking at, that. And, and so um, so the panel is 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 designed from that point of view. So you got to have in a keyboard instrument a master volume, right? So. And then uh, buttons that determine whether you're playing or whether you're editing. And then uh, 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 the um, instrument, you could have two what we call instrument definitions active at a time in the, in the uh, instrument. And so we had multiple parallel, not wave form generators, but wave shaping generators. If any of you saw the, the Salmar construction talk last night, I talked about parallel wave shape, uh, wave um, tables that you could fade back and forth. You could fill one with data while you're listening to this one, and then you could pan over to this one, and so on. That was a principle that came out of that instrument. This had a similar idea, but it was not, wa uh, not wave shapes, but wave transforming tables or wave shaping tables. Uh, and so you could, um, you could pan back and forth between instrument A and instrument B. Uh, so you would uh, be, able, you'd be able to do that uh, in this section here. So you, you would have, there are no numbers showing here, but if it was running, you would. And you pick us, these are panning speeds. So you, or sorry, these are panning speeds. And then you can hit here, and it'll pan over to that instrument. Or you can pan to the middle, and you listen to both, a mix. Or you can pan to the right, and you pick the speed that you want to make this transformation. Very powerful tool in performance, right? For something which is all about you getting your hands on the instrument. You can do all this in software now. You know, it's relatively trivial. Uh, but, you know, getting your hands on stuff, which was still in intention, uh, maybe hanging over from analog days, which we're now back in, uh, where you want to have your hands on the, on the instrument, right? So, uh, so that's the way that worked. And then, and then you could shift it up and down by octaves. And then this was something that I uh, was kind of proud of inventing. Um, manual partitioning. So let's say you're listening to two instruments at the same time. Um, you could assign a break point on the keyboard that would say, OK, the left hand will be playing this instrument, the right hand will be playing this instrument. You could then reverse it, you could clear it, reset it, or you could press the adapt button. So I came up with an algorithm that tried to follow, let's say you're improvising, 
You tried to follow what you were doing and infer what were, where the division of your hands was so that the, the instrument separation that's signed to the left and right hand would be, would be according to where your hands are and what you're doing. So it would look at how close they are, what's the density of this, how far apart, you know, what's a threshold of separation that would, it would determine. It was pretty cool because you could run all over the keyboard and you would have, you'd have these instruments following you. That's code based or circuit? What, like that was code based. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. And then uh, data entry buttons where you could program stuff uh, and show you later. Ability to tune the instrument like you can, you know, when you want to tune your violin, you could tune the instrument to whatever you're playing. And time scaling, you could make everything go a little faster or slower, depending on if it, you might have pre programmed the different uh, time values. And then the basic parameters parameter articulation. So there was, and then these are offset knobs. So these are the main parameters for the sound synthesis pitch, FM frequency, FM index. Uh, you know, and this was, of course, in the time of the very controversial purchase of the FM patent by Yamaha from John Chowning. That's a long story. I can tell you a lot about that. Uh, and then what we call timbre. Now, timbre is. If you, it, you know, I'll show you a little more graphically later, but uh, the, it, it is the size of a window into a wave shaping table. So let's say, you know, think of an axis like that, and you're, it's memory, okay? And uh, a waveform of some kind is generating the memory address lookup numbers. So in this case, it, most of the time it was a sine wave, okay? So if it's a line going like that, it's linear. So what goes in comes out. So if it goes this way, this goes this way, and the, 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 uh, the, the sample comes out following what the, what the driver is. If it goes like this, right, then it's going to add distortion. Basically, it's a very sophisticated distortion unit, right, that wave, uh, wave shaping. And, uh, but the amplitude of that sine wave going into the lookup table is controllable. So if it's very narrow, you're only looking at this much of the table. If you widen it, you're looking at all of the table. Um, I'll show you a little bit more graphically about that. But what if you're modulating that? That window. That gives you a whole other world of uh, timbre control. And that's what's timbre modulation. So timbre modulation frequency camera modulation index, and then gate level is the final output uh, of the, uh, that, low, that uh, low pass, that duplicate. All right. So these are the things you want, we wanted to have our fingers on. And then program stimuli, these would be determined uh, in, so, in, the, in the basic software that you could program without a terminal. Uh, you could define certain stimuli, and they could be, in addition to the keys, they could be buttons, and they could be either on, off, toggle, or they could be uh, uh, momentary switches. So if you wanted, you could program these to mean anything you want, right? And believe it or not, you could load and store programs onto cassette tapes. <laughs> That's where that came from. Well, what would be stored on the tape? Like control data or sound? The the uh, uh, no, it would, it would be your your instrument designs your. Oh, like all, like the all, all sorts of pattern, uh, parameter stuff, yeah. things having to do with the MARF, uh, and so on. So this was my unit, which uh, reached a point of not functionality. Uh, and it's now, in, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and it's now in the hands of Rick Smith, who worked for Buchla and has a, a, um, an instrument um, He's a master at restoring uh, old instruments, and he's in Vancouver, and he has a big collection there of instruments that he's been restoring. So that was my setup, and so you can see I added a floppy drive and a and the monitor you have to have no matter what, and then I had a, a keyboard. I mean a terminal. And that's what it looked like. The back of it is kind of interesting too, because it had a lot of interesting ways to connect to the outside world. Uh, that one's a little out of focus. I apologize. So let's look at the close-up. So you'd have, you'd have uh, signal outputs. 
mono, stereo, and quad. Uh, the quad was a, a, a spatialization, kind of quasi-spatialization thing that used an all-pass network. I don't know what that is, but it's, uh, you could, it, it, basically it's a set of filters that change the phase relationships of the signals and the outputs that if you set it up in a room like this, it would give you a sense of kind of spatial movement. Um, okay, so it's a balance to and from tape video to the monitor, RS-232 for connecting to a terminal. And then you could have control of all these outputs, so you could control other things. So various program one, program two, key press, tablet. It had an XYZ tablet on the keyboard. I don't think maybe you didn't see that. But um, actually, there. I forgot to talk about this. This was a tablet that you could, you could move left and right and get separate outputs and pressure. Right. It's basically area of skin time contact. And that could be used as a control, but also as a, a, a source of programming, actually. And then, uh, so the tablet outputs. And then you'd have um, status inputs. Those are for outside signals. A sustain one, two, you could plug in t uh, keyboard, I mean uh, pedals. Program stimulus nine and 10, those were like those buttons, but there's a couple more of them that you could plug in from the outside. And then the cr control voltage inputs, you could control the system, the instrument itself from external control voltages. And uh, then the external ones would show up in the software. You could direct them to something, to some uh, uh, parameter control. And then these I added, these were, these were uh, connectors that I added to my unit that uh, uh, allowed me to uh, connect to all kinds of other things, uh, digital controls to various um, sensor units. I built a sensor interface, I'll show you. Uh, that's what it looked like on the inside, lots of ribbon cables. <laughs> um, and there you can see a little closer up view. That's a nightmare to maintain, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's there. And Don and I signed Model 1, serial number 7. There were only seven of these made, I think, or maybe eight. Um, and then, all right, so here's a little, here's a, another block diagram. So it had the 9900 CPU, 64 kilobytes of memory. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, uh, it had, uh, the programs were, were the, the basic software was stored on uh, read-only memories that uh, were used there. A disk controller card, if you had that, uh, there's a display driver that would show you, that would actually show you the, uh, a display of the of the, um, the 64 channels of the MARP going up and down, uh, so you could watch it. Uh, any other thing you want to plug in? Keyboard panel interface. Here's the 64 channel function processing unit, back panel, and so on. And then the Model 360 was the digital wave shaping signal source. That was the digital oscillator that Don made. So we would actually draw wave shaping table charts. That. And that would give us uh, the definition of a certain timbre range, a timbre array or a timbre world, that would then get loaded into the, the uh, proms. Uh, you could also load them in from uh, external software on my instrument, uh, and so on. <clears throat> and then that data would go in and it's, it's you know, we had it, it brute force hand, hand stuff, right? So zero, zero, zero to FFF. <laughs> Hexadecimal notation. Uh, okay. Uh, I wrote a manual. That's the, just a picture of the manual, the Touche User's Guide. And since it, we called it the Touche, you know, there's, there's derivative words there. You know, the Touche, the, uh, the French organ stop or key, uh, Touche, the fencing, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, so I, I named the programming language FOIL, 
which stands for far out instrument language. <laughs> <laughs> there it is with the, so this display is now showing, this is one, of, one page of displays. This, this is showing you um, a bunch of, these are all names of instrument programs that have been programmed in. And then you can go pages, you can copy and initialize them and then, and then uh, uh, you can, um, you could move a cursor with that with that pad over here. You could move a cursor around, and so you move it, and then you tap it, and that would be the same as like clicking your mouse. <laughs> so there's, and then there's a here's a page of uh, uh, programming. Um, so, and this is programming. So it's not a very good. This. Sorry, it's just a photograph of the screen, and I, I don't have the instrument anymore. So, <laughs> but you're basically these are lines of of, uh, of the MARF. Um, so there would be time parameters, uh, you know, delays between going from one breakpoint to another, uh, something having to do with uh, oh whether it's a step or an uh, interpolation uh, interpolated, um, and then the voltage level, and then what to do with it. So stop or sustain, or blow, where, and then where is it going to go, and you know, these are actions that it would, would have to take place once it reached that point. So it looked like that, and then these are things you can make it contain, contingent on a stimulus value, about you know, a jump or a loop or something um, that you're programming, but that's what the screen looked like. Very high resolution display. <laughs> that's a joke. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's a, here's a display of a particular wave shaping function. So you can imagine the sine wave scanning maybe this part, and you get this little wiggly thing, and then it goes over here, and you get a bigger, you know, much bigger, uh, basically addition to harmonic or sometimes non-harmonic content to the waveform as, as you go through it. Here's, a, here's one that's been restored. This was at a... There was a Buchla Memorial Festival in San Francisco, and uh, Rick uh, had, I went up to play on that, and uh, he'd uh, brought down uh, what had been restored and is functional and had a display of a bunch of different instruments. That was just a few years ago. Oops. Okay, and then this is actually the inside of the one of those brochures that, if you have it, described how we described the... Uh, um, how we describe the instrument. So this was, uh, <laughs> there's the manual partitioning thing, all the stuff, and it says, here's an instrument that puts the power of computer technology at your fingertips. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll never be keyboard. Yeah. Again. Right, never do, never do uh -huh. keyboard again. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, we were, you know, we were having fun with it. <laughs> Um, here's, here's a, here is a, I'll play you an example of what it sounded like. Um, I have a record called Future Travel, which I produced very soon after the instrument was designed. Um, at, uh, recorded it at Francis Coppola's studio in San Francisco, Zoetrope Studios. And it has the Touche uh, running foil. And it also has a 300 system running a language called Patch 4. Patch 4 was, uh, was um, a, another, I didn't design, uh, write that, uh, a guy named Doug Crow wrote the, wrote the code for that. And it's, uh, uh, it was a system that ran on a, an Intel 8080 <laughs> CPU, 8-bit computer. Um, and so, um, but the, the connectors that I put on the back of my machine allowed me to go back and forth. So I could actually run, I could actually drive the Touche with patch four, or I could run it with foil, or both at the same time. So foil would actually be uh, determining the instrument specifications and all the timbres, and patch four might be giving it sequence information, for example. And so I designed um, programs for this. And, um, but this uses uh, the, the uh, logic controllable function generator to its max. And maybe you'll hear this.
chose that one because what I'm doing as a performer is I'm, uh, in this case, I'm uh, choosing various harmonic and subharmonic series relationships that are being articulated in the pitch structure of this whole thing by touching things. And I can transpose by touching things, transpose the whole thing. And I can cause uh, it to take different logic decisions in the sequences that are, that are coming along. So that's what's going on there. But what you're hearing is the sound. The, you know, the sound of the instrument with certain particular instrument de uh, definitions. Now, of course, that could be infinite. Um, here's another example of a piece. That was about 1980, 80, uh, 81, 80, came another piece that I did collaboratively uh, with uh, Jacqueline Humbert, who's a performance artist, and uh, we did a bunch of songwriting together. A, a piece called Daytime Viewing, which was, uh, it was about that. <laughs> it was about television culture. And I did the entire, orchestrated the entire project, started out first as a theater project and then eventually came out as a CD, as a cassette and has been recently released, re-released as a CD on Unseen Worlds Records. And just as a different example of, of kind of how it sounded, um, here with a little bit more free, free, some more free improvisation over a, a different kind of song structure. <laughs> She was a survivor through no choice of her own. things you can do with a touche. So everything was electronically synthesized, including what sounded like claves and everything else. So uh, so that's just a range of it. I, I did then um, a, a lot of pieces with it over a period of time, but one uh, that was particularly um, uh, a big deal uh, example of what I call propositional music, music built from sort of uh, modeling, uh, is, uh, was a piece called Zones of Influence, which was a concert length work for uh, solo percussionist where the instruments all have sensors on them. And uh, I built a sensor box that um, could connect directly to the touche and then developed a series of five movements that last about an hour and 15 minutes or something like that, um, which uh, was done with the touche. And that was a, that was a setup uh, at the 1984 New Music America Festival that took place at Cal Arts actually. This this one, and uh, just to show you what it might look like in a big setup. And then this was my sensor box, as such as it is now in my archive, <laughs> uh, with uh, faded pieces of paper, um, but um, a, a graduate student at Mills College. And I uh, put this together, a guy named Toyoji Tomita, who was a great trombonist and got from all of electronic music. Uh, he's no longer alive, unfortunately. Uh, so it, it had eight channels of, uh, of uh, 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 circuitry to designed to take sensor inputs. Uh, could be 
uh, piezo sensors or you know whatever. And uh, so it had controls for sensitivity, at, um, gain, various kinds of filtering, and so on, and envelope following. And the envelope following was dual level. So you would, if, when the signal reached a certain threshold, you'd get a pulse. And when it continued up to another threshold, you'd get a different pulse. So you could, you could sense, let's say, a, a low level separately from a higher level and route them separately. Um, and then uh, this connected to the to the touche. There it is in my kitchen, the back end of it. So each one, uh, you know, you'd have these uh, these separate levels. This little piece of paper would actually tell you what they actually were. But you know, the inputs for the signals, uh, outputs from the filters, and so on, and the multi-level uh, uh, envelope uh, generators that came out in banana plugs because I was going to be able to hook them up to uh, let let's say a uh, you know, a modular system, um, but the uh, the uh, multi collector connector here would take all this into the touche. Right? <clears throat> uh, yeah. So there, there's the <laughs> the uh, there. That's it. So you'd have the low pulse, the high pulse, the envelope follower signal, preamp out, filters in and out, etc. And here's an example from that piece. Uh, this is from the first movement in which the percussionist is playing has three snare drums, actually, uh, low, medium, and high pitched. And uh, everything is programmed uh, to follow different kinds of, of ways he interprets the score, uh, dynamic changes and various kinds of things. But it's driving the touche. It sounds like this. <laughs> Stop it there, and I marked it original touche. Um, I subsequently now have developed a what I call touche two, <laughs> which is a, a big giant reactor program essentially, and I've been using that a lot lately. And here's the same piece with that program, which is uh, the, uh, the screen is shown there on that monitor on the right. Uh, that's a picture from uh, I was really lucky to have a. A 50-year retrospective at the Whitney Museum in the, the new Whitney, which opened in 20, whatever it was, 15 or something, and um, they decided they wanted to open their new performance space with a four-day or four-event series of my work, which was really incredible. And so we did that piece, and it looked like that. Here is a picture of the main panel interface of what I call Touche Two. So this is a good example here of the, the wave shaping. These are the wave shaping tables. In this case, again, two instruments, similar to the original touche. Um, uh, various ways of panning back and forth between them, uh, again, similar to the touche. Uh, in this case here, I have I just made a, arbitrarily an, an uh, eight-segment version of the multiple arbitrary function generator, although if you get inside the programming more detailed way, you can get access to much more than that. But just from the, from the panel, um, you have a timing value, uh, a timing, um, you have a, a level value, you have interp interpolation in this case is continuous, you can determine how much interpolation, um, and then actions. So this says go to the next segment. Uh, there's not, see, I don't see one here that's 
got a very interesting program, but you can uh, jump to number eight, et cetera. You can, so you can set all these conditions. Uh, there are, you know, these are continuous control inputs and arbitrarily assignable uh, uh, functions. And um, the same kind of we, what we, um, when I say we, uh, the uh, design I did, uh, worked on with, collaboratively with a, a programmer named Martin, Martin Zvartis, who did a lot of programming for Native Instruments, actually. Uh, now has his own companies in, uh, in Holland. And, uh, <clears throat> and he, wasn't, he was at Cal Arts at the time that we did this together. And then the quad space and various other kinds of, uh, of uh, modulation uh, ability. And you can, the, the design of these things is, can be very systematic, actually. So you can design uh, one of these, I forgot, one of these adds uh, odd harmonics to the waveform. Another one adds even harmonics to the waveform. And uh, as you expand out the window. But again, you can have the scanning window can be this narrow or that, that wide, right? And you can move around the center, actually, uh, if, if you, you want, want to do it that way. So the new Touche 2 in a different part of Zones of Influence. And this is available on a double CD from Pogus Productions. Um, and it sounds like this. <laughs> Just simply a reloading of a new instrument definition, right? So that all can happen. Uh, so the score, I think we probably don't have time to look at this, but I was going to perhaps look at, there is a score for this. Should I take a look at it? Sure. All right. Um, all right. So uh, I have to come out of this for a second. Um, I recently, the piece was not documented. Look, there we are. Uh, um, was not documented, um, where it is here? Well, I'll just go here. There's a, uh, I just have a new album, so if you go to my website, you get the <laughs> promo for it. Uh, it. It could be interesting to look, look at because uh, it is, uh, there's Don and me playing a duet together. Let's see, uh, where did I put this? Um, must be here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, because it was a bear of a piece to, um, to document. So just to run through pages of the score, um, just to show you the kinds of things that I had to do. There's, there's all sorts of notes and instructions and so on. But here's a page that shows you those are the wave shaped, shaping tables that are used for the piece, right? They're, they're stored in memory. And they each have very you know, particular char characteristics that are, that are very carefully designed. In other words, they're not, you know, you can draw them arbitrarily, but, but there is a way to be very specific about it. There's a set of polynomials called Chebyshev poly polynomials you can use to actually control uh, the harmonic structure of, of uh, waveform. And the old and the new instruments. And then each, each um, movement has a particular design uh, that in, these are tables, these are actually tables of uh, data that go to the melodic and other parameters 
of the piece, and uh, the whole piece is is based on ways to transform what I call an origin shape to a target shape. So it's it's about uh, transformation of something, as it's you could think of it as variation, but it's like morphing in a way. You know, you know, if you start out with a carrot and you're turning it into an elephant, at what point does it lose its resemblance to a carrot and start to look like an elephant? I'm doing that in a, I'm thinking of that in an auditory way, how your memory recognizes things. So and then there, all those shapes are here, and here are all the data tables for the shapes. So if somebody wants to do this piece with their own system, the data is all there, and you can, it's a big project, but you can do it, <laughs> right? So everything is there. So how you dock it there, so this shows, this is, this is the shapes that are articulated in the snare drum movement, um, all of them, uh, and each one and how they transform from one to another. And then the, the actual data is there. So each movement has its own setup and diagram like that. And it took me a long time to make this score, but I finally, I you know, decided we've done this piece a lot, recorded it and all that, and nobody else can do it because none of the material is available. So I finally decided to do that. Anyway, I just wanted to show you that very quickly. Uh, and that is freely downloadable. Uh, if someone wants, if you'd like to... Uh, have it, you can have it. You just go to the website and um, and you can find it. It's uh, in. It was a 1980s composition, and all my scores are, are categorized by decade. Uh, and then you scroll down, you can find it. Here's another. I'm going to bypass that one because I think we, it, eventually it goes into another way of actually using a violin scan, um, it, which is uh, uh, has it's a it's a multiband parsing system. So the violin is playing only glissandos, and as it moves up and down, it activates different things as it goes into different frequency ranges. Uh, part of the same piece, but I know we're getting we're getting close to being running out run out of time. Um, here is an example of uh, using the instrument in an interactive way, not totally unlike the, what I'm going to do next Thursday on my concert, uh, using a, um, um, a disc clavier and um, the Touche 2. <laughs> So that's, uh, that is, um, that's a uh, Yamaha Disclavier driving the Touche 2 software. Um, well, that's my studio <laughs> with a re reactor program and my modular instruments. Uh, I'm going to be using some of that in the electric strings project. And uh, which starts tonight and has a concert on Friday, and um, it it again it's based on uh, interfacing with uh, with frequency parsing, uh, with the uh, and I'll be using an electric violin, and I use I use a very small modular setup that is designed specifically for to be played by my electric violin. That's what it's designed to be, um, and. This is, a, this is an example of my new album that just came out about three weeks ago, uh, in which uh, the great uh, trumpet player, electronic musician, Sarah Reed, and I, she was a, a doctoral student of mine several number, number of years ago, and we've been collaborating a lot. Um, and there are a lot of Touche 2 things in it and other things as well. Here's a little sample of a track from it. <laughs> Time for questions or answers. Or... So, anybody? Yeah. 
Um, my thoughts are, like, where, how do you feel about MIDI polyphonic expression now that it's being like a thing that's being uh, more adapted towards a lot of DAWs and especially musical instruments? Right. Um, how do you feel like you draw like similarities from MPE and, and what you've been doing with Touche? Well, um, you could certainly, I could certainly adapt the, the, the new version to MPE. I haven't been doing that very much because I've been interested in driving it with, uh, um, although I played an example there of um, uh, using a disc clavier. Uh, I also, and I will be doing this next Thursday too, I like, I like actually using acoustic signals uh, because of their um, somewhat unpredictability and their what I call deviant resonances. You know how there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a push-pull in the system and there's, a, it's, there's not a clear boundary between this and this. It's not so discreet. So I like to push it around that way. Uh, that's just me. That's just what, what, I, what I use. Um, my way, the, what I use to send signals back and forth is, is entirely OSC. So I, I use OSC for everything. Um, just because it gives me so much flexibility. So um, I don't have a very deep answer for you about that, but I think uh, uh, it could certainly be adapted. Um, and uh, it, it certainly expands what MIDI used to be able to do. Uh, so that's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, I, I, like, I like to tend towards, towards uh, data as data. Uh, and then I decide what the interface is. And so um, that's just me, that's just the way I like to work. You know, there's a reason Miller Puckett put out something called Pure Data, and he got, out of, got, got away from the Max world. <laughs> because, you know, uh, I, I sympathize with that. Because, you know, it's just data. You do it, you do with it what you want, and then you manipulate data as data. So. That's my tendency as a in my way of working, that's all I right. Yeah. MPE has certainly got great potential, I think. Any other questions? Four minutes. I have one, it's sort of a technical question. I was looking at some of the wavetables on the score that you uh, yeah. downloaded. And um, uh, I noticed that some of them in the middle don't cross through zero. There's That's sort of, right. And which, which means if you were to modulate those with the low amplitude sine wave, you would get a bunch of DC offset. Yeah. Right? How do you, is that a problem? Or you just well, you would, it? but it, it would be turned into a, a waveform, right? Right. Uh, so um, it's still, yeah, so, well, yeah, you're right. If you were just modulating in the middle, that's yeah, right. Yeah, the range was like narrowing in the center. That's it's right. It was narrow in the center. So, so probably I'd have to look at one of those and just and and talk it through. But probably, I probably would have most likely designed it to be wider, uh, with you know more jitter on the on the outside yeah. uh, of that. But that you know I would do that by ear once I designed the designed the shape itself. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, you, you can get into all kinds of weird stuff. And one thing about nonlinear wave shaping is it gets very complicated very quickly, right? So you have to be, you have to really get down to details and if, if you want to do subtle things, uh, you have to be very clever about how you design those, uh, those shapes. And of course you can, you know, these are all driven by a sine wave that's driving the tables. You could drive it with something other than a sine wave too. And then it would be like putting a complex wave through a complex uh, distortion pedal, <laughs> right? And you'd get a modulation, you'd get a change, and so on. And sometimes it could be interesting to work that way. But, but it does get very, very, you know, the wave gets very compli complex very quickly. Um, except in certain of them where you can design it to be specific to adding certain kinds of harmonics, like the odd harmonics or even harmonics, uh, where you can be more accurate in predicting what the output's going to be with certain kind of settings. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so did you say this instrument is still available today that we can play it? I haven't distributed it. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, the, I've been asked about making an app out of it. Um, 
and I guess my biggest uh, fear about doing that is how long it would take to write a manual. <laughs> 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 so I just haven't done it. I just made it for my own pieces, and I haven't gotten into the idea of, of uh, distributing it. I could, but I haven't. Also, you are in no way in connection to a company called Expressive E, where they have two shows. Sure. That's yeah. what you were talking about. What is it? Again? Like, there's a company called Expressive E, where they sell a product called Touche. No, I have nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with it. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever hooked one up to the Touche too? Hooked what up to Touche? One, <laughs> one of the things that you're talking about, the Touche. What to you're touche talking about? No, no, no. I, I really don't know much about that. It's like a, it's a standalone Expressive pedal. Where it has the depth, and mm -hmm. then you have X, Y, and Z, yeah. and you have like yaw and pivot right. for right. different types of functions you can program it to. No, I, I, I've never used it. Okay. And I'm not affiliated in any way with that. <laughs> we came up with this name in 1979, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. What kind of stuff were you able to control with the, um, the XYZ pad that was on the left on the original Touche? What about it? Uh, what, what were you able to control with the XYZ pad? Anything you want. Just just consider it a, a source of uh, continuous voltage, or um, and you move around it, you know, in in three dimensions, like a joystick, you know, a three dimensional one. Although the pressure sensitivity was a little different in its feel than the left, right, and uh, up down, so you have to get used to that. So it's an arbitrary, it's an arbitrary source. You, you patch it to whatever you want. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, David. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.